Our next topic is called ransomware and cyber insurance. This is always a, a really interesting and evolving topic. Um, a great group of panelists today. Let me start with Chris Ballad, Managing Director in the Cyber Risk Practice of Kroll. Chris helps clients respond to data breach incidents as well as uh, CFIUS audits and brings years of experience in digital forensics and incident response to the table. Before joining Kroll, Chris is a partner and vice chair of the data privacy and cybersecurity practice at the law firm Lewis Brisbois. And he's joining us today from Philadelphia. Welcome, Chris. Hi, glad to be here, Bruce. Thanks. I'm also very pleased to introduce Scott Goddess, a partner at Barnes and Thornburg and co-chair of the data security and privacy practice group at that firm. His practice focuses on cyber insurance. He's helped clients over the years to obtain more than a billion dollars in insurance coverage. He also litigated one of the few court cases regarding the scope of coverage available under a cyber insurance policy. Scott's joining us today from Washington, DC. Welcome, Scott. It's good to see you, Bruce. Thanks for having me on. Always very pleased to welcome Ed McNicholas to this conference. He's a partner and co-leader of Ropes and Gray's data privacy and cybersecurity practice. Ed represents clients facing complex data privacy and cybersecurity issues and litigation investigative and counseling matters. He previously served as an associate counsel to President Clinton, uh, also lead editor of the PLI treatise, Cybersecurity, a practical guide to the law of cyber risk. And Ed is joining us today as well from Washington, DC. Welcome, Ed. Great to be here. Finally, I am delighted to introduce Jennifer Coughlin, who was our moderator today. She is the founding partner of Mullen Coughlin she focuses her practice solely on providing organizations of all sizes and from every industry sector in first-party breach response and third-party privacy defense legal services. She's counseled hundreds of clients in investigating and responding to an event compromising information and system security. Joining us today from Denver, welcome, Jennifer. Hey, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Let me turn it over to you. Great, thanks. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, today, our panel is going to be discussing ransomware and cyber insurance. And I think if you think or talk about cyber insurance, you can't ignore ransomware and the impact that it has had on the industry over the past few years. Uh, organizations have been falling victim to ransomware attacks for years, but the past few years, uh, it's really ramped up. We saw a lot more ransomware happening to a lot more organizations. And as a result, we've seen an evolution in the cyber insurance community. So today's discussion is going to be focused on the evolution in the underwriting processes, the offerings, and then the claims handling process. So we're gonna jump right into it and start talking about the evolution that the panelists have seen in the underwriting process. Scott, do you wanna lead this discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the industry has been talking quite a bit and I'm used trying to select neutral descriptors <laughs> about how how their world has changed and their loss ratio for years and years was in the mid 30 to maybe 40 percent range which means in terms of the amount that they paid out versus the amount of premiums that they took in uh, and then in 2020 and 2021 they went uh, reportedly up to low 70s so uh, still making money but a pretty remarkable change from um significantly more money coming in than going out. So what has happened is premiums have increased significantly for virtually every corporate policyholder, and the application process has gotten uh, more challenging with more questions and more details in there. And so as the policies have changed, and so luckily most carriers have broadened, had been broadening their coverage for quite some time to include things like ransomware, what people had found starting in early 2020 and continuing through present date is that premiums have gone way up. The coverage terms have either tightened or the limits have gone down or both. And the application process has been significantly more rigorous uh, with, with more wide ranging questions that are, are part of the process. Can you talk more about the questions that you've seen? I know you oftentimes counsel organizations who are considering purchasing cyber insurance and mm -hmm. oftentimes assist them in preparing the applications. So looking at the applications from years ago when it was a very soft market, um, comparing them to the applications that you've seen now and over the past 18 months, uh, how have they changed? 
So the, the applications are asking more details about what systems people have in place, what cybersecurity measures are in place. And for corporate insureds, there is uh, significantly more focus in terms of having conversations, detailed conversations, detailed discussions, and drill downs by the underwriting team with the, the policyholder and request to have numerous people attend. And so I have, I'm aware of numerous Fortune 500, 100 clients, et cetera, or just large scale policyholders where the underwriter has said, we need to have a discussion with your team. And as you might imagine, it, it elicits quite the interesting response, particularly from a CISO or someone else who's running IT and questions of why are they asking this? Why do I need to do this? Aren't I trying to buy a product? Shouldn't they be trying to sell me? And also, what do they know? And, and I've actually had people come away um, happily impressed with the level of questions that were being asked. And, and here's the curious thing. Um, you might actually say, wouldn't the, this be best for everybody so that carriers could engage really in loss control and, and vetting and double checking the answers that are being provided within the application so that if a carrier understands a question one way or that's what their coverage counsel says at the time of claim, if there was more time spent with applicants, then really it, it would be win-win insofar as fewer claims, better understanding of what is in place, what could be in place, and, and the scope of what is in place. So for example, if a policyholder acquires a company or has multiple affiliates, and there are questions about, do you do the following? Do you use the following? Do you have the following? You, As the policyholder, you might say yes, because your thought is, well, some of us do, or we have it in some places. And, and at the time of claim, will coverage counsel for a carrier say, we asked you, do you have this? And you said yes, but what you really meant was yes in some places. And, and in a perfect world, those, those interviews and those discussions would take place to eliminate and reduce questions and make certain that everyone's on the same page. And, and, and my final point on this is cyber carriers undoubtedly have the largest trove of information in terms of what attacks are out there, what works at preventing them or doesn't work at preventing them and what can be done to mitigate. And, and in a perfect world, they, were, they would use that for loss control, helping policyholders say, hey, look, we asked about this and this is why. And, and what, what can we do to get you in a spot where you're a, a better applicant, a better risk, better protected against these sorts of things? Chris, I know Kroll offers an insurability assessment, and I think many organizations have taken Kroll up on the opportunity to go through this assessment in preparation for renewal meetings or applications uh, for cyber coverage. Can you talk more about why you came up with the insurability assessment and exactly what it does? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this dovetails very nicely into what Scott was just talking about. You know, for example, uh, do you have MFA? That used to be the question, right? Uh, it used to be some variation of that. Uh, and for everybody, the less technical as well, multi-factor authentication. So not just a password, but also a prompt to get in. Well, the real question, as Scott kind of just alluded to, is where do you have it? Who has it? Is it just administrators? How about your financial team, right? The most business email compromises are geared towards monetization, and they target payroll, um, uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable types. So there's really some nuance that has to be around it. And that's what I think the industry has gotten really good at learning um, and knowing that uh, even getting the answer doesn't mean you understand what the answer means coming in. So for example, do you have MFA? Yes, we have product X in front of our, our systems. Okay, but if I go to the web browser and I get into your G Suite environment that way, is there an MFA prompt? Well, no. And crawl incident responses engaged. Um, so some of those nuances are a big deal. Another issue is patching. 
it's easy to say, yes, everything should be up to patch. That's how you keep those vulnerabilities closed. Um, some of them can be severe and need an immediate patch, but a couple of things. One, what does that mean to have a patching schedule? If there is a CVE, we've heard that term before, uh, the, the idea that there's um, the company, the software developer, the hardware developer has said, there's a problem with our product. Bad guys are going to get in. Uh, type of thing. Um, a, you may not know that. You're not going to visit every developer and manufacturer website you have a product for every day. Two, there may not be a patch for a month or more. We saw that with some of the firewalls. And three, it, when you patch, you tend to break things. Every time you turn your computer on is a new experience for some people uh, in some systems. So there is uh, a lot of problems around, a lot of nuance that just simply asking, do you patch or have a patching schedule isn't enough. So really that's how we came to develop our program is to help to ask those nuanced questions, but to understand what the answers mean because it is complicated, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And do you see most organizations, once you answer those nuanced questions, taking steps? to become, from your perspective, I'd assume the argument would be that they are more insurable if they take these steps. Yes, where, and definitely where it's motivated by the organization, there, the will is there to do it. Um, I have unfortunately had clients who have engaged us in that kind of practice who um, really wanna check a box and we have to be careful to be, you know, we report the facts, we report accurately to them or to the carrier that's engaging us or the broker or who, whomever is, is the uh, party who's brought us in. Um, but the, the truth is some, I, I suspect, go on to make representations a little more broad than they perhaps should. But I do find it's a high degree of the indicia of reliability that they're actually fixing things when they engage us themselves and they're very invested in the process. What are the top three actions you see organizations taking after they go through the insurability assessment with Kroll? Yeah, fixing the MFA. Uh, just having MFA in place is not enough. For example, uh, I do not understand why the industry isn't louder. Uh, Crawl certainly shouts at the top of our lungs about this, uh, the idea of legacy protocols and M365, Microsoft, um, and getting, you know, and in Google, I forget exactly what they call it, something similar, uh, but that idea of making it so you can't log on with a system that can't be prompted for MFA. So therefore you can simply bypass it's like you didn't have it. Um, so we see that is a, a fix that is usually very affordable and completed uh, pretty quickly. The other one that uh, that is often, the other step that's often taken is actually fixing what it is that the, what, what technologists like to call the security stack. The, uh, the idea of the software and the services behind it uh, making it so that it's streamlined and usable. Uh, you can have a million products, a million monikers of AI driven and machine learning slapped on it. It's all completely useless if nobody's there to do anything at 2 a.m. when St. Petersburg is awake. So the uh, uh, we see a lot more uh, robust security being put in place, whether they're getting what everyone calls MDR, managed detection and response 24-7, um, or going to some kind of uh, program where A, the product makes sense for them, and B, somebody's actually watching it and doing something. So those are the big takeaways that we see people really respond to and fix. How about incident response plans. I know carriers ask about them, and I think you're pretty involved with many of your clients in developing incident response plans with them. Can you talk more about how you work with them to develop incident response plans that would make them more insurable? Well, we tend not to focus uh, primarily on insurability, but just uh, more on regulatory compliance. Um, the biggest thing is to uh, actually have a plan that's customized for the company. So that inf it actually maps how information would really flow in an actual cyber incident so that companies can move quickly. So oftentimes people just, you know, so I'll give a client will say, just send me over an incident response plan. And it's like, well, yeah, we have, we can send you a model 
but it's not going to do very much good unless it's actually adapted to your organization uh, and reflects your systems and how the information is going to flow. And the best way to do that sometimes is a tabletop exercise where you walk them through a plan. Um, it is amazing, though. I, I rarely see clients pull out the incident response plan in the middle of an actual incident. Um, it's uh, probably the the old rule about uh, uh, plans never survive first contact with the enemy uh, comes into play. People tend to just start uh, going on instinct. So if people are going to do that, that's going to be a normal response. You have to develop those instincts so that people are at least, if they're going to start running, make them run in the right direction, uh, as opposed to um, this being a novel experience for them. And, and Jen, if I can jump in on that as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I think one of the, because this is the panel to talk about it, one of the fascinating things about the instant response plan is that uh, query how many people have contact your insurance company on the list or at the top of the list. And, and in fact, I was at a dinner um, with some of Ed's colleagues and uh, and someone who was not at the firm turned to me and said, she said, you know, we've got this great incident response plan. Where should insurance fall on that, if anywhere? And I said, it for your next section of the, the discussion, it should be call number one so that you're, you can understand what the carrier is going to agree to or not. And and I'm not saying when the carrier say, if you don't call us first, you don't get anything, if that, that that's right by any means. But understand that that's the position that many of them take and that many carriers say, if you don't use our team or get approval for the team you'd like to use, then you're out of luck. Yeah, I think this is a good segue into the discussion on the evolution of the offerings because the offerings tie into the milestones that you may undertake in your incident response process. Um, so Ed, tying back to the incident response plans that you work with your teams to develop, how do you integrate insurance as one of the key stakeholders in the incident response process in the incident response plan? Well, it's, it's interesting. My, uh, my sense is that you want to have insurance as a stakeholder and recognize their role, but also recognize the, the primacy of the uh, attorney-client relationship. And so uh, oftentimes we'll make sure that um, we get in, especially endorsed onto policies um, and that people pick their team in advance so that you're not going and saying, I'll just take the, uh, the standard package that you have people that have actually worked with the, um, the company in the past. They know it. They're not coming in kind of cold. Um, that they have people who the technologists, the law firms are integrated uh, in advance and you could have the discussions with the insurers about rates and ways to work together and all that. Um, and then I think there's some real tension there in terms of the, um, is the insurance company retaining counsel or is the client retaining counsel? And whose interests are the counsel advancing? Um, I think in ransomware, that becomes a, a crucial issue. Um, just to elaborate on that, as you're going through ransomware, as you're going through a ransom event, you could have uh, any number of harms. Some of the harms are reputational, uh, loss of customers, uh, and then payment of the ransom. The insurance company probably only covers some of those harms. It's not going to cover the fact that um, uh, the business interruption is often not included. Maybe if people have business interruption, but loss of future revenue, loss of reputation isn't covered. Um, and so you have this kind of tension of, do we wait longer and pay a lower ransom? To how far, how long do you negotiate? Or do you pay earlier, perhaps more, but perhaps enhance your reputation? That kind of discussion on how to figure, how to work with that tension in the middle of a ransomware event um, can be, you know, quite stressful so much better to have a discussion with your carrier in advance about those tensions and their philosophy on addressing ransom. So I think that's one of the biggest things is just to make sure that there is a, a good relationship um, up front and that people kind of understand uh, where the client wants to take it. And it's not kind of driven by the insurance company, but really driven by what the client needs. And I think it would be helpful to spend a few moments discussing the pros and cons of paying earlier, restoring earlier, 
versus negotiate, negotiating paying less later and restoring later. Do you mind spending a few moments on that? And then Scott, I'll turn it over to you to talk about from your perspective, the coverage implications. Sure, it, it's, it's interesting. When you look at it, it depends on the type of company, right? If it's a manufacturing company and they have a gap in production, their, their clients may well say, well, we're very sorry you had a ransomware incident, but we need to find an alternative supplier. Um, and that may be that one opportunity that your competitor gets to come in and say, hey, we can provide this to you. And then they're you know, starting a relationship with your competitor because you've had this gap. Now, other, other companies, they might be able to be fine with a little gap uh, a couple of days. Uh, but it's very, it's, it's, it's interesting. Some clients are, you know, it's very sensitive. We're working with a, a drug manufacturer who had a ransomware incident and they provide a key drug that's used uh, as part of uh, anesthesia. And hospitals, you know, need this. If they don't have this drug, they can't do surgeries. Um, and so they were very concerned that if they were down for too long, then they, they would go and there's only like three companies that provide this. And so that hospitals would link up with uh, and integrate their supply chain in with another uh, supplier. So there's this question constantly of, do you want to just get back up quickly as fast as you can and maybe get pay a little bit more on the ransom? Or if you negotiate down, one of the biggest factors in what you pay in the ransom is how far... Uh, out from the event you're talking about. After a week, it starts disappearing. And sometimes uh, I've seen actually uh, attackers, if you negotiate long enough, they just walk away. They just stop the negotiation. And by that point, maybe you've, hopefully you've restored. That's, a, I think, a key question about how do you time that and then how the coverage works um, uh, here and there. I mean, if you pay, if you want to pay more, Will the insurer go along with that because it's so crucial, particularly when they're not paying all the costs, they're not paying, covering all the harms. Scott, from your perspective, how have you seen the carrier discussions going with the pay earlier and more, but mm -hmm. restore earlier versus <clears throat> pay later and less, but restore later and have more business interruption? <clears throat> so recall that I typically get brought in when things are messy. Um, for the, the kind of regular workaday things, the carrier does the right thing, steps up and pays, people tend to not give me a call. Uh, people don't call me and say, hey, listen, everything's going great with my carrier. Can I, can I hire you and pay you your hourly rate to just hang and, and watch? Uh, it tends to be when things are messier. And, and that comes about when, um, when the ransoms are large and or the client wants to, pay, wants to pay the ransom and then being reimbursed very, very quickly. Um, carriers, carriers are not necessarily used to, in my experience, taking into account the business impact when thinking about things, particularly if they have handled claims outside of the cyber context, right? Where there's a lawsuit about something rather than they say, well, I'll, I'll only resolve the case based upon what I think it's worth and not the value you see to your business relationships or whatever. And I have had carrier personnel and their counsel tell me we don't have to account for that at all when figuring out how to resolve and whether to resolve claims with your business partners or keep them happy. Like that's completely outside the room. It's like, well, it's the entire point of, of resolving things in a manner that makes sense for a business, particularly ransomware, right? If you, if you can wait forever in a day and not have to worry about impact to your business, then that's a completely different discussion. And the, And better claim adjusters, whether internal or external, recognize that pressure and will be partners with the company. Um, ones that are not good business partners will bring in outside counsel and say things like, hey, why do you want to pay the ransom so fast? I bet it's because you, you, you didn't tell us how sloppy your systems were. Um, or maybe you didn't tell us about, you knew about these risks or whatever it is. Um, I would never tell you about client circumstances uh, but but maybe that's the kind of thing the questions that come about in the worst case scenarios. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that adjusters should pay attention to, and and to tie all that back together to Ed's point and to in your question, Jen, it, talking with the carrier and saying, 
we would like to resolve this now and it will be significantly less expensive for us and for you if we pay the ransom now and here's why i mean that's a conversation that can be had and a one where you're going to be under the gun and it's going to be stressful but having that conversation and explaining it to the adjuster and if the adjuster is doing the right thing then the adjuster will say she'll say okay you're i get it uh you're right and and there are to ed's point about the business interruption better more robust policies do cover business interruption loss in terms of what what's in the policy and so again an adjuster who's thinking through might think oh the ransom is x dollars but if we don't pay it then the the amount of business income and extra expense that would be incurred would be huge and it, it so here's one that you'll appreciate i've had circumstances in which the carrier says why do you want to pay so fast i bet it's a problem with your systems and you 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 know we, we have questions for you uh when they wanted to pay the ransom and then i had one where the client didn't pay the ransom didn't want to pay the ransom and i had the adjuster call me or outside counsel call me up and say why didn't they pay the ransom and this these business interruption numbers are huge i mean if they just paid the ransom this would have been resolved much more quickly i was like i, I can't win <laughs> you know? no matter what the client wants to do the council's like questioning it so but but to avoid those having that conversation explaining here's why we want to go down this path and here's the impact it will be on us and on you carrier uh work with us and work together with us that that's that that avoids the friction ideally yeah so what changes have you seen in the offerings by the cyber insurers for coverage relating to ransomware so there, there are two big changes that have come around. Uh, one that has yet to be rolled out, a big splash where the London market, AKA Lloyd's of London, um, insurance nerds like me call it the London market, say to all the London market authority participants, hey, you've got to include new war exclusions. And so if, for example, the carrier is able to prove that the attack is in connection with a war, then they would say they don't have to cover. Um, but there are, there are carriers out there that have uh, inserted a handful of exclusions that are ransomware related. Some of them have so, something called co-insurance, which means for every dollar the carrier pays, you have to pay. So you satisfy your retention and then you're sharing the, the pain on a percentage basis. And so maybe it's 50-50, maybe it's 80-20, whatever it might be, rather than having satisfied the retention and then getting the carrier to pay, they're saying, you satisfy their retention, you're still paying out. Um, some carriers have put in an exclusions and endorsements saying things like, if it's because you didn't update your outdated software, you didn't remove your outdated software, or unsupported software, or we'll look at it if it's a widespread attack or other things that are designed to just um, be financially painful for the insured in the event of an attack. So Scott, what you're talking about with the war exclusion, um, we have a question from the audience. I uh, would love to hear about types of actors, uh, actor attacks insurance might not cover. For example, state-sponsored attacks. Has this started to impact the types of attacks occurring? So it's a great question. Uh, it's like I said, the London market is putting that into its policies starting later this year, requiring it to be in policies later this year. Uh, the language is yet to be seen and tested. Uh, what has happened in the past um, there are a handful of cases. Uh, the, the most famous ones are the not Petya cases. And the allegations were it was a state actor that attacked and that American companies and otherwise kind of caught the shrapnel as a result of this state sponsored attack. And so carriers then said, oh, well, gosh, this is definitely an act of war and it's excluded. And the, the action largely was under property insurance policies and whether there was also business interruption covered under property policies, an entirely different discussion we can have over another exciting hour, uh, but set that aside. If, and, and people who spoke for the insurance industry said, don't worry about that. That's just under property and non-cyber policies. It will never, ever, ever be a problem under cyber policies. So don't, don't get worked up about this litigation. And then three years later, after decisions come down that say the war exclusions and those old policies do not apply, then all of a sudden, what happens? Is the, is it a is it is it a spurious correlation, or is it that the industry said, "Gosh, we better increase and improve and modernize our war exclusions"? Is it due entirely to the ongoing to the other side of the globe right now? 
Is it due to decisions that came down that said those exclusions don't apply? Is it both? I, no one has come on and told me and whispered in my ear and said, here's why we're doing it. But it seems to be some correlation between the two. Scott, what, I just thought uh, jump in for one second because I'm really curious about this point. Um, what have you seen in terms of intelligence operations? I think I'm thinking particularly like Yahoo, where they indicted two members of the FSB and then two um, kind of, I'll call them no good nicks, but this kind of criminal types uh, who were working with the FSB. You know, that's on one level, it's a nation state military opera. I mean, the guys on the other side of the keyboard were wearing uniforms, one would assume. Mm -hmm. um, is, that a, is, that a, is that a war or is that just espionage and is that covering so, bipolar war? So you might not be surprised to hear me say, I don't think it's war. Uh, I, I mean, and, and unless there's a declaration, from my perspective, it really should be part of part and parcel of a kinetic war, right? Because I, I can understand the argument, for example, of we as the insurance industry are either not able to or not interested in insuring against your building being dropped down from bombs from a B-52. Okay, I get that. That's not your kind of ordinary everyday sort of thing. Um, but But if the industry underwrites ransomware, does it matter if the ransomware is from someone committing espionage? Does it matter if someone's from an outfit that is officially tied to a state actor, or officially in an act of war? Or is it no different from somebody that is just out there to make a lot of quick bucks? Um, and, and I have had circumstances in which aggressive insurance company people are very, very quick to say, oh, this is absolutely evidence of it being in this war or warlike or other sort of related exclusion. And although the burden is on them to prove it, they'll just say, well, that's the position we're taking. And, and you're stuck saying, well, what can I do now? And do I have to go to court? And so a couple of policyholders did go to court on not patio. One won the decision, one settled right before it went to the jury. Another policyholder resolved things through a negotiated compromise with its carrier. Um, and so that that's the challenge, right? Again, I don't see circumstances in which people say, okay, listen, I'm not going to raise that. No one, no one comes to me and say, oh my God, my carrier said, uh, we're not going to raise these exclusions. They're going to pay. So can you help me? People say the carrier's threatened to raise these exclusions or has, what can we do? And, and then the policyholder is stuck trying to explain to a carrier that positionally just decided that they don't want to pay as to why all of that information doesn't carry the day. And, and Scott, I guess uh, I got to jump in here too and ask a question. Mm -hmm. If you think it's going to change the analysis that um, you know we've had seen a lot of press lately, um, where the veneers being dropped a little bit, and people are saying a lot of the ransomware actors, a lot of the uh, these actors are privateers, is the term they use. State mm -hmm. sanctioned, state potentially equipped and <clears throat> and backed, but not actually you know, not actually hanging their uniform on the back of the door before they start their money-making job. Uh, do you think that would change the way the language will play out? I mean, it should. It, it, from my perspective, you've got somebody that just says, well, I know that the the, the, the motherland will like it if I do these things, um, so I'll do it. Uh, does that, sh that should change it as opposed to somebody that's officially um, part of it. I mean, but again, that will come down to what does the language say? And, and probably if the case is large enough, what does a court say? And how does a court interpret it? And, and does the does the language get construed in favor of coverage and against the drafter? Um, and, and that's in the eye of the, the judge it's supposed to, um, but whether it will or whether it won't is a, a question yet to be seen, unfortunately. A related question from an audience member. How do carriers get comfortable from a know your customer perspective and anti-money laundering perspective and paying ransom to unknown bad actors? So I think it's related to what we were just talking about. But Scott, what are your thoughts? So Ed's laughing, so we'll go to him next. <laughs> when, when I've been involved, I see carriers all the time ask for sanctions check um, in terms of actually handling the claim and then want that sanctions check to be provided to them. When that what that means is they want a forensics firm or somebody in the know or in the know as much as you can to run an analysis and figure out is there anything tying proving the negative? Can you can you state confidently there's we've we are unaware of information tying this threat actor to a sanctioned entity and and handle it that way. Um, and then that that when you're proving the negative becomes the biggest challenge. I'm aware of circumstances in which 
um, even after there was a, a clean sanctions check provided and, and a proven negative of we're, we're not aware of this being a threatened actor and the carrier saying, okay, you're clear to go ahead and pay, time passed. And then the carrier said, oh, we just became aware of information on the dark web suggesting that your threat actor that we approved you paying is somehow affiliated with a sanctioned actor. Um, and then the policyholder was stuck. They made the payment. They've been told they were okay to make the payment. And the carrier said, we're not going to reimburse you. And ultimately, it took a, a no action letter from the government for the carrier to say, okay, now we'll pay. Um, so it, it's it's never a pleasant situation. Uh, but but that's really, really where the carriers become as comfortable as they can is is getting some kind of check from people that are in the know. And Ed and Chris, you guys see this every day. So, yeah, yeah the FBI is extremely helpful here um, in terms of of being, uh, uh, you know, able to let you know if there are uh, you're dealing with a, a threat actor that's using uh, a Bitcoin account or email address or IP address uh, that's associated with a sanctioned entity, uh, particularly as the number of sanctions against Russia has been exploding uh, over the past year. Um, that's become uh, quite complicated to make sure you have it because OFAC considers it to be a strict liability offense. I mean, if the payment is made and it was a violation of sanctions, um, it, you could be held liable. Now, in truth, they haven't gone after people um, when there are payments made and it turns out that um, the person, you know, they, after reasonable diligence, no, no link was discovered, payment is made, and then later, it turns out that there was a link. Um, and it's also, it's very hard because these actors, knowing they're on the sanctions list, are constantly moving around, changing their IP address, changing their Bitcoin, uh, because they want to get the, uh, they want to make sure everyone feels comfortable paying them. Um, and so it is quite a uh, shell game. Uh, and that risk of a link not apparent when you're paying, becoming apparent later is a very real one. Right. I, I, I agree with Ed on that. I, I just think that um, there until you and unless you can see who's at the other end of that keyboard and you know a bit, a bit about their history, you can't have that 100 percent certainty. But I suspect that, you know, uh, that that's that's OK not to have 100 percent. But best intelligence, uh, there's plenty of good sources. Uh, to be able to provide that intelligence that as of right now, there's no links known, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe these guys use Cyrillic and haven't mentioned Iran um, or anybody else. That That's another way. But ha relying on some of the experts to do that kind of background check, wallets are clean. Um, the toolkit that they're using doesn't suggest it's tied to Evil Corp or anything like that. Um, you know, I think that when the book is written 20 years from now, we might all have a very different perspective on who these folks really are, but we can't know that now. We just can't. Yeah, the uh, the benchmark is to determine whether or not you have a reasonable belief payment is being made to somebody who is sanctioned or tied to a sanctioned entity. Um, and the information that is utilized, it's not in a vacuum, just looking at the information on that specific matter. And you're bringing in the experts that have access to other intelligence. So we're looking at the Bitcoin wallet, but also tying that Bitcoin wallet to other attacks and uh, using the information and intelligence from those attacks. So I think everybody within the ransomware incident response process is trying to get as much comfort as possible, knowing that the OFAC strict liability is hanging out in the, in the future. Um, but every nobody wants to pay a bad actor and everybody is trying to get a great comfort level. Um, I think insurer and insure ed. I really do. All right, so we don't have much time left, but we have a question that will be a great segue into the discussion on the evolution of the claims handling um, and claims processes that we're seeing from carriers. So the question is, uh, what efforts are being made to provide insurance companies with digital forensic reports? Insurance companies would appear best positioned to drive cyber hygiene based off information generated from these reports, yet forensic reports with cybersecurity details are withheld. I would be grateful for any insights or color on providing insurance companies with forensic reports. So Ed, do you wanna lead this one off? Yeah, this is a good one. Uh, this is a good <laughs> question. Uh, because the, the forensic reports 
uh, if you've if you've structured it properly, they're a turning work product. Um, and if you give them to a, a third party, any third party, um, uh, you you look at potentially waiving work work product or privilege protections. Now the question is then, can you give it to an insured, uh, the insurance company, uh, without imperiling your work product? Uh, and that goes to the issue of whether there is a common interest in that. Um, and you're not really going to know that um, at the time. Uh, you can say, I mean, it's all going to be judged later when there's a class action lawsuit or some regulator um, uh, knocks on the door. And the question is, is a judge going to protect this down the road? Um, and so part of it is like just how sensitive the uh, information in the report is. Um, can you provide factual information to the uh, insurance company that is uh, excerpted from the report as opposed to doing the report? Um, some consul I know have just, sometimes they just don't generate a report at all because they're so afraid of a regular asking for it. There's no report created. Or they do something, uh, I, I think I try to avoid people doing the cutesy perma draft. There's never a final because it's just draft forever. Um, but um, you also wind up telling clients, hey, listen, facts are facts. You cannot privilege facts by putting them in a report. Um, and maybe that's the happy medium here is to get the forensic firm to just stick to the facts in the report or have sections of the report that are simply factual. So you can share that information with the FBI or the insurance company uh, and leave out speculation. The worst thing is when they have in the back of the report, and here are all the things you could have done to avoid this problem. Here are recommendations. <laughs> um, and it's just like, would you just make a list for the class action attorneys? Just of here's all the things that we were negligent about. Thanks. Thanks for putting that thing there. That's just beautiful. Well, Ed, Ed, can I ask a question um, that I always want to get the answer to being the one who's got to generate the report? Um, and no, I don't want to put the recommendations in writing. That's right. Um, but the, you know, for example, the, the sometimes the firewall CVs, um, what we'll see is a certain pattern of activity afterward. There's never a definite forensic artifact that is created. So really, we're saying with very high confidence, this is all we would ever see without having the threat actor's computer, but the patch level was just wrong. I don't want to say just right, just wrong. And then we saw, you know, a threat actor appear and any desk is dropped right away. It's a pattern we see all the time. The issue that I have there is it is definitely a forensic firm opinion a high comp, very high confidence one that this is that CVE, that particular CVE that's being exploited. But it is still an opinion. There will never be a hard forensic artifact for some of these things, right? Um, what would you think that um, should be in the report and what could go to the insurance uh, carrier, et cetera? So, yeah. so I, I can jump, uh, and if I could jump in for a quick sec. Please. I mean, I, I agree with everything Ed said. I mean, he's, he's laid it all out uh exactly right and and to then take the next step is as the policyholder you are in a no win situation when it comes to sharing these reports because the adjuster invariably will insist upon seeing the report and saying that they can't adjust the claim they can't evaluate what to do they can't evaluate how to go forward without the report and understanding things and and the position of the policyholder really ultimately should be um, and what's being said in these reports, Chris, like whether that gets disclosed to third parties is what position has a carrier taken on coverage? And the simplest one should be the black and white would be if the carrier says you are covered in full, don't worry, you have the full policy limit available, no worries at all, end of letter, one pager. Yep, you're covered, all set. Then the common interest should be quite solidly established, no questions. And then the other end of that spectrum, if the carrier comes back and says, we are flat out not covering you because whatever the reason might be, we're not covering you, period, end of discussion, then you have a very, very strong argument that to say a third party will assert there is not a common interest because you are not insuring us, you've not covering us, you've denied coverage. But we live in the world where a 42-page single-spaced reservation rights letter comes out. 
and what and everyone uses that word but, or that phrase but no one actually understands what it means pretty frequently that means the carrier is saying there might be coverage but we are reserving the right to deny coverage whenever we see fit based upon the things in this 42 single space page letter so now what they haven't flat out said yes they haven't flat out said no they've said we might say no and the law in this area is well i know it when i see it and the more aggressive the carrier's reservation of rights is the more a third party will argue that you did not have an alignment of interests and therefore you sharing documents is not within the privilege and it would, the privilege is waived um again can you argue against that absolutely that's what a third party claimant regular whomever would say and the policyholder is stuck trying to make a judgment call at the time to say look i really need coverage i really need my carrier on board my carrier is insistent that they get these materials and but i also know that if i turn it over and someone's aggressive or an aggressive judge says i don't think it's privileged because they there was not a sufficient alignment of interest that privilege could be waived and and then what happens um and and i see policyholders on the regular have to walk that tightrope and figure out what can we do so sometimes there are conversations sometimes they're not but from my perspective it is the carrier response to the incident that that is creating this tension right if they just said flat oh yeah you're covered you got a cyber policy it's ransomware you got ransomware coverage you're covered we're aligned it should be all good i think it's hard because there there are consents required under the policy so how does the carrier obtain the information needed to provide the consent that the insured wants to receive so that they do receive coverage and then the dynamic life cycle of an event as well there's so much that can be incurred in such a short period of time and you might not have all the information that you need for you to feel comfortable with how you've responded and also ensure that the carrier has what they need to tell you what what your true out-of-pocket exposure is going to be yeah you're you're absolutely right because they they're not giving you the answers whether they have them in the background or not <laughs> uh they're saying to you well we're, we're investigating coverage we don't know that's when you're like really don't know you would argue well they 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 were at least investigating so it should be shared privilege uh but if they say we're investigating or we're we're you know we we reserve the right on these 18 different grounds uh but we still are demanding that you, we consent to anything you want to do any cost incurred any settlement you want to do any resolution you want to do you must get that permission from us and and then not that i've ever seen this before they'll say and but we're not going to give you any of that until we get the report and get this information so now as the policyholder you're you're as stuck as can be the carrier won't tell you whether there's an alignment of interests the carrier won't give you permission to take action um and are demanding things that are potentially a third party argues no longer privileged what what do you do I know we're of the school of thought that Ed referenced whereas we aren't we aren't having a report prepared in every single matter and if we are having a report prepared it's a thoughtful decision being made um, to understand who may ask for this report. And I'm not just talking about carriers, but other third parties that may ask for this report and what exactly um, is contained within the report. But I also don't see, I, I see carriers sometimes asking, is there a report? And also appreciating that just because there's a report doesn't mean they're entitled to it. There's a discussion that needs to be had with the insured. Um, and we also don't wear the coverage hat. So oftentimes the insured is getting their broker involved, other attorneys involved for that discussion. Um, but I think it's something that everybody's life would be much easier if it was decided in the context of first party incident response. But then what would we be talking about for, for all these <laughs> all these battles? All right, so I've got two minutes left and I know Bruce is gonna come on in a minute with a hook. So uh, let's go through a few more questions. Um, the OFAC person earlier said, as long as law enforcement is engaged, OFAC is unlikely to come after a company even if they knew the threat actor was on the sanctions list. What do we make of that guidance? Um, I know from our perspective, one of the immediate steps after our engagement is engagement with law enforcement, sometimes filing an IC3, sometimes uh, picking up the phone and calling the agents that we know. Um, but what is everyone's perspective? And Scott, I think I might be most interested in yours, given that you've gotten a no action letter from OFAC in one of your matters. Yeah, I got I got called in very late on that. Uh, there were discussions about sort of what happened. It was af well after the fact. But it... it from the kind of contemporaneous perspective, not kind of the actual contemporaneous perspective, it is working hardest to get the carriers uh, on board with your plan and making certain that the carrier has a comfort level. My goal is getting the carriers to 
to cover claims. And so the probably the strongest way of doing that at the, at the time of the event is to work with them and say, here's what we have. Here's what we found out. Are you on board with us making this payment and will you reimburse it? And, and doing what you can and with, our, with the information you have available at the time. One, well, and speaking as the retirement home for retired FBI agents uh, at Kroll here, um, I don't, you know, FBI is certainly very aware of these tensions and I haven't seen the FBI in a position where they would, they, they don't share information with anyone. Uh, that's a shock to no one. So I, I think that it's a solid move to report to law enforcement. I don't see law enforcement itself being the issue. Uh, prosecutors and regulators, I'll stay out of that conversation. So uh, Bruce, I know we have one minute, so I don't know if we have time to go around and ask, and ask everybody for their final thoughts or if I should just turn it back over to you. Well, I'm gonna do just a lightning round. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll start. Um, we've seen a lot of evolution in underwritings, offerings, claim processes, but I think the common thread is that the carriers continue to not back down from the risk and the insureds continue to recognize the risk and the value that insurance can play in mitigating the risk. So I think we will have a lot to talk about for years to come because I don't think cyber insurance is going away. And I'm not sure, Ed, I'm sorry, we didn't get to talk about whether or not ransomware would become uninsurable. That could be the, the next panel. <laughs> Scott, yeah. how about you? <laughs> so, again, as I mentioned, I see only the, the worst case scenarios. Um, doing everything you can to make your insurance carrier be your business partner. But uh, if they start sending you letters and taking a position that's showing that, that they're less of a partner, more of an adversary, being mindful of what they're saying and, and how to respond and, and, and seeing where they are positionally is pretty important. Ed? I think one of the biggest questions that's going to be out there is, can we figure out a way to have all the information that the insurance carriers are gathering and are being gathered by the FBI and to actually share this information so that the insurance companies can upfront provide more helpful information? I just, you know, every, every piece of material in this room has a fire rating and the insurance companies are just extremely helpful in, you know, making sure that buildings don't burn very quickly. Uh, can we do something more for cyber? And I think there's there's a dying need for that. Chris? Right. I think we're going to see uh, how these exclusions play out. I think there's a lot of need for discussions. I think we're going to see this claims review is going to pick up more where we have um, a kind of second look where there's been a reservation of rights and say the incident is closed out. Um, understanding how CVs are going to play out, those critical vulnerabilities and the exclusions for them. And uh, that'll be that'll be interesting to see where it goes. All you, Bruce. All right. Hey, thanks so much, uh, Chris, Ed, Scott, and Jennifer. Well done on the moderating. Thank you so much.